Welcome, Nathan. Thanks for having me. I have to just start by saying I am such a huge fan of yours. I feel so lucky to interview you and um, I'm just blown away by your work, by the amount of compassion you have and your willingness to really get in the trench and make a difference. So I have chills already. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I'm excited as well and it's mutual ad admiration and respect. So I'm, I'm so glad that we could do this. Nathan Runkel is the founder and president of Mercy for Animals, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing cruelty to farmed animals and promoting compassionate food choices and policies. He has worked alongside elected officials, corporate executives, heads of international organizations, academics, farmers, celebrities, and film producers to pass landmark farm animal protection legislation, raise public awareness about vegetarianism, and implement animal welfare policy changes. So tell me about Mercy for Animals Undercover Investigations. How are they carried out and what have they accomplished? Yeah, so Mercy for Animals, for those of, of your uh, viewers that aren't familiar, we're a national animal protection organization and we work on farm animal protection issues. So promoting compassionate food choices and policies, all in an effort to prevent cruelty to farmed animals, who, as, as you know, are really the most abused, the most exploited, the most overlooked and ignored of all animals. So our investigations are really uh, the backbone of all of our campaigns and efforts to protect farm animals. And the investigators who go into these factory farms are really the unsung heroes of the, the animal rights movement. These are people that care so desperately about helping animals that they're willing to roll up their sleeves, leave their friends and families, and go work on factory farms and in slaughterhouses to document the daily atrocities that these animals face. So our investigators, they get hired there, they work with pinhole-sized hidden cameras, and they document routine cruelty, you know, everything from pigs crammed in gestation crates, to hens crammed in battery cages, to cows having their tails cut off, to workers maliciously and sadistically abusing animals. Um, our investigations have led to uh, landmark criminal prosecution of companies and animal abusers. They've led to major corporate policy changes by some of the largest food companies in the world. Uh, and they've led to increased legal protection for animals. So, um, you know, the, the saying of a picture is worth a thousand words, well, a video is worth millions. And I think we're really at a time when people are more and more aware and sensitive to the plight of animals and where their food comes from. And we certainly believe that these investigations offer desperately needed transparency in our food system. Something I'm curious about um, is how pervasive is this behavior? Is the, are these just a few rogue uh, farms or is this really industry standard? Yeah, it's industry standard. Uh, you know, animal agriculture, especially intensive animal agriculture, has inherent abuses towards animals, inherent exploitation. Um, the, the race to the bottom line of increasing pro uh, profits has led to animals being treated as mere meat, milk, and egg producing machines. And we see that with every factory farm that we step foot into. Um, you know, what we consider sort of the most pervasive uh, suffering is actually the institutionalized abuses, things like confining pigs in crates where they can't turn around for their entire lives. You'll see this on 80% of um, pig farms in this country. Uh, snapping birds into shackles at slaughterhouses while they're still alive and slitting their throats. These are all standard practices within the industry. But beyond that, when you start to look at workers who engage in malicious abuse towards animals, beating cows with, with crowbars or stabbing them with, with pitchforks, this behavior is also much more widespread than the, the meat industry, at least, would like you to believe. And I think that's because people come into these factory farms out of desperation. They take these jobs, but they become desensitized to the animals um, and their needs. They sort of become dehumanized um, after working in these places. So 
the factory farms are just a breeding ground for for cruelty and abuse, and um, they're horrible places for animals, but also people as well. I was watching your Google Talk as I was putting my makeup on before this interview. It's a good time to watch Google Talks. Um, and you said intelligent, sensitive creatures have been turned into machines. You echoed that earlier, and um, I just started to weep when I heard you say that. And it's it's... It's very important, the work that we're talking about right now. So for everybody out there listening, I'm just, I'm so grateful that you are staying with us and a part of this interview today too. So thank you for that. Um, what should everyone know about ag-gag laws? Yeah, so undercover investigations have been so successful in raising the public um, profile and debate of factory farm issues that they've really started to impact profits for big meat companies. So what we're seeing now is a big pushback from corporate interests that would prefer that consumers be kept completely in the dark um, and how animals are treated. So what we're seeing is more and more states introduce what have been called ag gag laws or agricultural gag laws. Um, or whistleblower su suppression laws. And though these state bills vary in terms of language and scope, the underlying intent is to prevent undercover investigations. So some of them have outright bans on taking photographs or video inside of factory farms or slaughterhouses without explicit permission from the owner. So, um, you know, m much of these are being pushed forward by the dairy industry, b big meat companies. Um, thankfully, most states where these bills have been introduced, they have been defeated. But a number of states, including um, Iowa, which is the largest pork and egg producing state in the country, uh, has passed an ag, -ag law. So these are being challenged and in court right now. But, um, you know, I, I think that Right now in our country, we need more transparency in our food system, not less. And these agriculture gag bills pose not only a threat to animal cruelty, which thrives in secrecy, but also to consumer health and to the environment and to workers' rights and safety. Because if it becomes a crime to blow the whistle on corrupt behavior, uh, the, 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 the fallout is that we're creating breeding grounds where that behavior is essentially condoned and it's allowed to continue. And if you can't document wrongdoing, uh, whether it be cruelty to animals or environmental violations or, or, or food safety issues, um, we really have no democracy in this country and that's a real problem. Yeah. Real problem. No oversight, there's nobody protecting animals or protecting us, as you said. And, and on that point, a lot of people have this false sense of security that you know, in the 21st century, there must be watchdogs, there must be government oversight of how these animals are being treated. But as we know, there's not a single federal law that provides protection to animals during their lives on the farm. And most of the animals killed, which are birds, have no federal protection during slaughter either. So there really is no oversight for the protection of these animals. And it's oftentimes our investigators who are the only meaningful watchdogs who are out there exposing this abuse and calling for action. Thank goodness for that. You know, these things go around on Facebook a lot, signing petitions. And I, I can imagine folks out there are wondering when they see these things zoom by on Facebook, does it really matter if they sign petitions? Does it really matter if they call? What's the best thing to do? Yeah, absolutely. It, it makes a huge impact. Uh, so we definitely encourage everyone to share these undercover videos. You know, social media has really open the floodgates for information and we can help distribute information to our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, people that might not think about the plight of animals. Um, and now with YouTube and being able to show videos online, we're seeing really a snowball effect of more and more people um, waking up to the power and consequences of their food choices and demanding change. And that all, um, you know, now can originate from everyday people using social media in an intelligent way. Um, but in terms of signing petitions, it also can have a huge impact. We have been able to pressure some of the largest food companies in the world, including Nestle and Tyson and others, to make big policy changes. And much of that is driven by 
people signing petitions, contacting the companies, and making a fuss on social media. Um, so it absolutely makes a difference. I love it. Make a fuss on Facebook. That's, that's a campaign <laughs> right there. Um, we have this incredible opportunity now with social media to actually, in some cases, do the work that the government isn't doing. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Cool. I'm yeah. sure that makes everybody feel like <laughs> the time that they take just briefly really does matter. Absolutely. And, you know, recently Nestle, the world's largest food company, made a dramatic animal welfare policy announcement that affects 90 countries, thousands of suppliers, hundreds of thousands of farms internationally. And when uh, the story broke in the New York Times about this policy change, one of the things that Nestle attributed it to is the fuss that was being made on, on social media about the cruelty taking place to their suppliers. You know, we, we live in a different era now where these companies are, are very in tune and sensitive to social media and their image and the conversations that are happening there. So it's absolutely vital that we continue to speak up on those platforms. Tell me some more stories about your biggest successes. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, the Nestle announcement, I think, is, is hands down one of our biggest, if not one of the biggest corporate successes ever for farm animals. Um, you know, Nestle, who's behind DiGiorno Pizza and really dozens of other international brands, um, decided after a Mercy for Animals investigation at one of their dairy suppliers to implement a whole host of really industry leading animal welfare policy changes. So, things like doing away with tail docking of dairy cows, um, cutting off the tails and castrating piglets without painkillers, um, doing away with gestation crates for breeding pigs, uh, veal crates for calves. Uh, battery cages for egg laying hens. Nestle started looking at these issues and said, we don't want to support this as, as a global company. And um, they implemented this policy, which they're now, uh, which they're now actually um, implementing uh, in 90 different countries. Um, we've also gotten big policy changes out of Kmart and Costco and Safeway, all doing away with gestation crates for breeding pigs. But, you know, to me, it's it's a success for each and every person that becomes aware of their food choices, that moves towards a plant-based diet, whether they become completely vegan or reduce their consumption of those products. And we're starting to see, um, with reduced meat consumption, fewer animals actually being killed in the U.S. The slaughter rates are going down. And if you look generationally, we see with each passing generation, more and more people uh, moving towards a plant-based diet. So, you know, I'm really eternally optimistic about where we are heading uh, in this movement to help animals. Me too. You started this when you were 15, right? Yeah. You started Mercy for Animals when you were 15, Nathan. <laughs> Half my life ago now, yeah. Um, this year celebrated Mercy for Animals' 15th anniversary. Um, and it's been a really incredible, rewarding journey. Um, you know, I, every day we're faced with suffering. And, um, you know, I say that we see the darkest side of humanity, but also the brightest side of humanity with the work that we do. I see the violence and cruelty that we are capable of, but I also see the selflessness and compassion and empathy that we're capable of as well. And I think that really at the core, the animal protection movement is about elevating humanity to its fullest potential. It's not about just being against cruelty. It's being for compassion. It's about um, living in line with our values of being fair and kind and considerate to others, even if those others take on the form of a cow or a pig or a chicken. And it's about using our power that we have uh, for good. You mentioned suffering, and this is something that I've been so curious about, and you may have answered it, but I think you could probably give me some more um, advice here. You see so much of it, and I'm just curious, how do you stay so open and positive? It's a good question. Um, it, it can be challenging. I think being, being um, honest about that is, is really important. And, I, you know, the animal protection movement sees a lot of activists get burnt out from the work that they do. And I think it's because we don't acknowledge that we are in a trauma-related field. Um, 
we are witnessing animal suffering. Some of us, depending on our role in the movement, much on a much more regular basis than others, but we have to exercise some self-care. We have to nurture ourselves. We have to find a balance. And I think, um, you know, that can, be, that can be challenging when you're faced with so much suffering. But if we're going to really be in this for the long haul, and that's what the animals, you know, really demand of us is that we take a, a long-term view perspective on this issue because, um, you know, we're not going to, to win this overnight. Um, it's going to, to take many years. So we need to keep our eye on the prize. We need to celebrate the successes that we have, um, both large and small. It's, it's really important for us to, to be mindful of that. I think that's great advice, and that's great advice for everybody. And I'm certainly the self care queen, so uh, I just I really am so moved by your response. And um, for folks who are really interested in moving towards a compassionate, plant based diet, I'd love to know some of your ideas on that, some thoughts, some tips that you give. But I'd also love to touch upon the folks who they're just not ready or they're, for whatever reason, they're not able to go 100% plant-based. Um, what would your advice be to them as well? Yeah. So, you know, our, our motto is definitely progress over perfection. I think that a lot of people, um, you know, when they first learn about these issues and they start looking at their food choices, can feel sort of overwhelmed that you know, they have to go from eating the standard American diet to, to vegan, and they don't know what to eat, uh, where to start, where to get new, nutrition. So I think it's important that people just embrace the, the journey, they embrace the, the progress that they're making, um, and, and they stay very connected to the intention um, behind those changes. We're big supporters of Meatless Monday, you know, getting people started on that journey. And if, if everyone in this country went meatless just one day a week even, we would spare over a billion animals the horrors of factory farming. And if you look at, at the decline in animals being killed, much of that is because of what's called flexitarians, people that are eating less meat. So we definitely support that. And what we've, what we've seen is that people feel better when they do that, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, because they're not supporting, you know, this type of violence as much. Um, and then they start to move more and more in that direction. But helping people make that transition is a big part of what, what we do at Mercy for Animals. We have a website, chooseveg.com, where people can get all of the how-to tips. We have a starter guide that they can order, they can get it in the mail. We have a whole email series with how-to tips on that. So, you know, we want to make sure that people don't feel like they're just sort of guilted into making a choice that they don't know then what to do. We want to show people how fun and colorful and delicious and rewarding, you know, a plant-based diet can be. Perfection. Um, so that's chooseveg.com and also mercyforanimals.org and all of which is at chriscar.com or below this video on YouTube. Um, and then lastly, this is very important because sometimes it's hard to ask when it's you, but I can do that for you. So how can folks support Mercy for Animals? <laughs> well, they can make a donation. Uh, they can go to our website, as you said, mercyforanimals.org, completely tax deductible. It goes straight into our programs of protecting farmed animals. So absolutely encourage everyone to, to join the organization. And, um, you know, we rely on donations from individuals to carry out this work. Wonderful. Well, you know, so many of us out there are looking to move away from stuff and towards stuff that matters. Absolutely. And your work matters in such a big way. So I just want to wrap up by thanking you, Nathan. Absolutely. Thank you. This has been a, a pleasure. You are awesome. And, and so everybody, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Please drop a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your feelings. I want you to open your heart and share it with us. And also please share this interview with your friends on social media um, because that would mean a lot to Nathan and I. Okay, so thanks again and we'll catch you next time. Take care of yourselves, everyone. Bye.